morning, Westport. I said, good morning, Westport. There you go. Got people still coming in. Come on in and stand with us and worship this beautiful Sunday morning. There we go. Amen. Amen. Psalms 100 says, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with thanksgiving. Know that the Lord, he is God. Amen. Amen. If you believe that today, say, praise the Lord. Lord. Say it louder. Praise Praise the Lord. Awesome. You may be seated. Thank you for being here today. I loved hearing you sing. That's a great song to start off our worship today. Just bless the Lord with our hearts, with our voices. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for gathering together. This is the Lord's Day. Sunday, the first day of the week, the day that Jesus rose from the grave, the day we gather together to worship all week long. You can worship by yourself. All week long, you can pray with people in your family and friends. Today, you get to come together as a body of believers to worship Him. And that's exciting. And we're excited for what we're going to be doing here today and the worship team leading us. Thank you so much. Got a special guest with us today. I know you're probably going to say something about her later. For right now. Well, this is... Golly. This is my friend that I met a couple of months ago. 
I heard her sing on the Branson Showboat, the Branson Bell. Y'all, y'all heard of that? You ever been there? Oh, yeah. And uh, was just amazed. And uh, I stalked her after the concert <laughs> and followed her to her car and begged and pleaded her to come sing at the church. But no, I really didn't. But she graciously came today. Would you make welcome Miss Macy Watts? Woo! All right. Amen. We're thankful. We're thankful for that. And we're just uh, thankful for the whole team that's back there. It takes a, it takes a group. Uh, it takes some groups in the back. And we appreciate the, the group in the back doing all that they do. I know from time to time different technical things that make us look so much better up here because of what you guys are doing back there. Thank you guys for doing that. There's a guy in the back, one of the youth. Wow. How, what, how old are you today, Jaden? He's hiding. He's trying to hide. It's Jaden's birthday. Y'all say happy birthday. Yeah, yeah, we appreciate you guys serving in the back. He, he just can't stand it. <laughs> I had to mess with him, had to mess with him. If you have a bulletin, we are thankful that we have these things going on. Fall Festival, we need your help with that. There are sign-up sheets right through that door that you can help out. You need to sign up and help us with it, okay? You don't have to do it the whole time. You can do it for an hour and take a break for an hour. Just pick which hour you want to do it. We have two hours that we'd like to have the fall festival for one another and for the community. So invite someone to be a part of it. Invite a family. Invite some kids uh, to enjoy that time together. You'll have a chance, like I said, if you work for an hour and you, you um, fellowship for an hour, you'll have some time to have fun as well as work together. But we do that all together. Also, you see some other things coming up, an apologetics conference. If you want to learn how to maybe defend your faith a little bit better, then uh, sign up for that or be a, be a part of that. That's on the, the 23rd. You can sign up. Uh, I think there's some flyers in the back, or I have some as well, but you can sign up online for that as well. Uh, it is a $10 fee for that because you're going to get lunch, and there needs some commitment there. So that's going to be exciting. Mission Moments. Um, hope you'll see that, especially the drink of water thing. You'll, you'll clue into that more in the sermon part. Uh, but invite a friend. Invite someone to church. And uh, we talked about eternity last week and really being prepared for that. Being prepared for eternity. So last week, we had two funerals from people within our church. Two funerals. Funerals can be tough, right? Can be a tough time for you, for family. And um, I even heard some people talking about funerals today and, and how difficult they are. And some people don't like funerals, don't like to attend f- funerals. And, and sure, I mean, I'd rather attend a, a birthday party. I'd rather attend a, you know, a celebration for someone who's turning 98 years old, you know, like we had, or someone than that, than, than a funeral. But a funeral for a Christian, for a believer is really a time of celebrating that they've left this world, they've left this flesh, and they've gone to be with the Lord, gone to be with other Christians who've gone before. And sometimes we make it too sad, and we forget that it's a gateway into heaven. It's a gateway out of this, the saddened situation of the world. David struggled with that. And when he had a son, when he was young... The Bible says, uh, because of sin and some other things in David's life, that the Lord struck the baby that Uriah's wife, that's Bathsheba, had born to David, and the baby became ill. David pleaded with God for the boy. He fasted. He went home. He spent the night lying on the ground. Some of you understand that. You know what it's like to struggle with death or struggle with with someone in the hospital, and maybe you have literally laid on the ground in prayer or frustration or agony. A couple weeks ago, when Lynn Smith's husband, Ken Smith, passed away, we were talking about that, and we knew David was sick. Um, But people say funerals come in three, and I, I didn't know who or what the other third person was, but someone suggested might be here or there. And I don't like that. You know, I just didn't want to. I said, I don't want to talk about that right now. Um, Sure enough, David was ready, went to know the Lord. And later during that same week, Eddie got sick. He went, had a procedure done in his heart that we were hopeful would make him better, make him more vibrant. But during that surgery, a clot came out of his heart or came out of where they're working with his heart and caused a stroke in his body. But the doctor said, you know, that happens sometimes, and we can 
hopefully get that taken care of. We got the clock taken care of. We'll see. He came out. He was talking gibberish, but trying to talk, trying to move. So it felt like maybe through some therapy and some time, he could get through with it. Friday night after the ball game that week, I get a call or get a text from Julia and I call her and she says he's doing bad, doing bad. Um, I'm going to call the kids and let him come visit. That's why I'm on my way. So I get to the hospital and uh, it's just a tough time. He's not like himself. He can't smile, can't talk, can't tell jokes. And I'm just kind of like David here. I'm, I'm outside the room for a while while the family's there. And they said, you can come in. I come and I sit down. I take his hand and I talk to him just as though he can hear me. Because sometimes the hearing is still there. And I just cry out to the Lord. We pray. And the doctor comes in and says, I can't give you much hope. His body is, is shutting down. And they let us stay in that ICU room for a while because literally that may have been one of the last chances to be with him. And the family left and I left. And there's Julia by herself in that room with her husband and just, uh, I could not leave the hospital. I went out to the, to the, uh, to the room there out, outside and then I, I stood there for a while and then I went out to my truck and I just sat in my truck. It was 1 o'clock in the morning, 1.30 in the morning. I just couldn't leave as I feared, Lord, if, if something happens in the next 30, 40 minutes, there's Julia going to be by herself with her husband. And I felt kind of like David here, lying on the ground, calling out to the Lord. He wouldn't even get up. He was unwilling to eat anything, it says in the scriptures. And on the seventh day, the baby died. And I asked you last week to really contemplate your existence, your eternity. And I want you to do that right now. We usually take up a time of offering and it's a time of solemn time. It's a time, you know, through the years it can be all kinds of stuff. And I want today, yes, you may have a check or you may have some money to give to the Lord, but I want you to just take a moment in this offering time. So men come forward and I want you to offer yourself unto the Lord for whatever's going on in your life and, and be prepared for eternity. If you want to come during the altar, we're going to have the music playing. If you just want to pray right there, you do exactly that. Lord, take what we give you today, more than just money, silver or gold. Take our very lives as that song that we just sang said, and we offer it up to you. May this be a solemn time where we just think about our own existence and what you're asking us to do, who you're asking us to be today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. She's just playing and getting ready for our next song. I want you to know I didn't read the rest of the story. The rest of the story says that after the baby died, when David learned of it, because his servants were trying to keep him from it, because he was so distraught and lying on the ground, it says that David got up from the ground. 
I want you to stand to your feet right now. Stand to your feet. Get up like David got up. It says that he got up from the ground, he washed himself. It's like you go to the bathroom, wash your face, put on perfume, you know, fix your hair. He got up from this time of mourning. He washed, he anointed himself, he changed his clothes, and he went to the Lord's house and he worshiped. And I'm calling us to worship our Lord today because there is hope beyond the grave. And we praise him. And as this praise team leads us, cry out to God and worship him today. this next song I, I told Macy we'd give her just a little bit of a break and I would sing one and she's got such a beautiful voice I wanted her to sing the whole service but she just said well I'm, I'm sorry I'm rushing ahead so we're going to do one old hymn for you then I'll sing one uh, so y'all just uh, you know it's time to just come back and, and get back to the grassroots of our Christianity and some of the old songs really bring that back for us doesn't it so listen to this one Blessed Assurance Blessed assurance, 
Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. All right, here we go. Submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above echoes of mercy. You know, in times like these, when things are starting to look bleak, when things in the government are turning in sometimes ways we don't really think they should, and there is coming a time where I think that, um, and I know it's already happening because we see the news of a preacher in Canada that's been arrested for just trying to keep his church open during this time. And it's times like this that we really want to plan our feet in what we believe, amen? So this song talks about that. We believe. In this time of desperation When we all know it's doubt and fear 
There is only one foundation. We believe. We believe in this broken generation. When all is dark, you help us see. And there is only one salvation. We believe. We believe. Sing it with me. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And He's coming back again. We believe. So let our faith be more than anthems Greater than the songs we sing And in our weakness and temptations We believe, we believe We believe in God the Father We believe in Jesus Christ We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back again. Let the lost be found and the dead be raised in the here and now. Let love invade, let the church live loud. Our God will say, we believe, we believe. And the gates of hell will not prevail. as I was driving up this morning there was one part in this thing in this song that just kind of hit me as I was listening and I just I just wanted to just cry right there because it talks about we're gonna this gonna take things away from us but we gotta stand firm in what we believe so let's just sing this last chorus just one more time and think about how the words affect you and how as you go out today and we can sing these songs as loud as we want to in here, but out there, what do they see? What do they hear? They see us and how we treat them. We see us being kind to somebody. We see us giving to somebody. And that's how you may be the only, the only Bible, that old saying, you may be the only Bible that people see. So let's sing it and let that sink into your heart. Just one last chorus. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And He's coming back. He's coming back. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands, washed
this out.
Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. Come on. You have no right. When your name is spoken, there is peace that can be found. Just in the name of Jesus. And today, God, if there's someone here that doesn't know your son, Jesus, today I pray that they speak the name of Jesus today and they ask that simple question for him to come into their heart. It's just that easy to have eternal life with Him and with our Father. Thank you so much for the blessings of music that you've given us and this talent that has been on the stage this morning. Lord, we just give all of that praise to you. We thank you and we lift your name up. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Isn't that great? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what they say, if that doesn't light your fire... Your wood is wet. <laughs> Woo, I can't tell you how many other pastors and preachers and maybe even some of you would love to speak or love to proclaim the name of Jesus after worshiping like that. And I am honored. I am humbled to be able to do that today. I want to talk about encouragement today. Encouragement in the battle because we are in a battle each and every day. And it seems like it gets harder and tougher and uh, Worse at times. So if you turn to First Chronicles chapter 11, there's a typo there in the bulletin. That's my typo. So uh, 12 and 11 both talk about mighty men. They talk about the strength of David and the stuff that David was doing. And if you look at the life of David, it started maybe as a shepherd. It started maybe with Goliath and how people began to follow around him. And as he led people into battle. But you see it throughout the scriptures. And this portion of, of Chronicles, you see how he is sharing this. And, and, and we see the, the struggle and what's going on with their forces. And we get a tidbit, a taste, a glimpse of some of these mighty men, some of these people, and what are the things that they do. And these three men that we're going to look at today gave encouragement for their leader, David. And I just want to share that with you today because you are in a position to give encouragement to the people you come in contact with. Because of this fight, this daily battle, it may be a widow, it may be someone else, a, a son that lost a dad, it may be uh, a person at work. Um, we talked to a guy yesterday and we were moving Michaela and we talked to this guy and he was sharing with some of the struggles that he's having at work and some of the things that may happen and it may cost him because of things going on at work it may cost him his job and we tried to encourage him told, told him we'd be praying for him we'd be lifting him up because he's wondering where, where his next paycheck maybe in a month or so may come from he sees that in front of him and so we are in a position to encourage one another each and every day and the story that unfolds here is of three men who were very encouraging to David. 
Like I said, it talks about the mighty men, verse 10 and following. It talks about mighty men, verse 11. And these, king, these captains and these ones that did this with a spear and this one that did this. And, and then verse 15 is where I want you to really look at because it gives just the picture of this story for today. It says, the three of the 30 chief men went down to the rock to David. So these men went to David. David was there in this cave of Adullam. And there were the army of Philistines that were encamped in the valley. So you can understand it was a battle time. It was a tough time. And they went to their their leader and they wanted to encourage him during this time. Be with him in the battle. That's something that's important in encouragement is that you're there in the battle. You're present with someone. Sometimes As pastors and other people have said with a person that lost a loved one, they don't know what to say, what to do. Sometimes just being there with them is enough. They were there with David. David was there in the stronghold. And the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David said with this longing in his heart, uh, he he was crying out basically, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. He's in the thick of the battle. He's dealing with a tough time. They probably had some tepid water here. They probably had a little bit of a jar of water there. But the thing that he longed for, the thing that would give him the strength to keep going was something that he probably had as a child, something in his early years, something, uh, a portion of his life that he remembered. He says, oh, that I could take that drink, that drink again. That would give me encouragement. That would help me during this fight. And as he voiced that, these three guys heard it. He said, it would be in this well at Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three broke through the camp of the Philistines. I don't you understand that little portion of scripture is pinned quickly, probably in summary. But (laughs) it would take a while to really describe to you how difficult, how hard the idea of this. I mean... These, these Philistines were their enemies. They hated them, right? And for years they had been fighting to get back their own land from the Philistines. And so even though it's pinned so quickly, it was something that took blood, sweat, and tears. And for these three guys, they were risking their very lives to go into the camp of the Philistines. And when I say it, it happened, it's not like they said, oh yeah, we're afraid of you, come on in. No, it's you come in and take it. But you're going to have to kill me first. And so these three guys did exactly that. They went into the camp of the Philistines, but they had to kill people on their way. It says that when they got there, they drew water out of that well. So it's almost like at one point, the the three men that were fighting, one of them had to stop fighting, get surrounded by the other two. He had to then get some water out of the well and put it in something, probably put it on his back and pull out his sword again and say, okay, let's get out of here. And so they took this water, and brought it back to David. Can you imagine being like David? Being being parched, wanting something to drink. You know, as we were moving in Michaela, that's how I was yesterday. And when when I was given a drink, I was like, oh, yes, I'm not waiting. I'm taking it. I'm drinking it right now. I'm getting refreshed. But at this moment, David, instead of drinking the water, which these three men went after and obtained and brought it to him, this sweet tasting well water from when he was a kid, instead of drinking it, it says that David took it and would not drink it. But instead, he poured it out on the ground. To us, that'd be like a slap in the face. We just risked our lives And now you're not going to drink that which you long for, that which you wanted so bad for. Drink it because you need it. You need the taste. You need the encouragement. But he's saying, no, it was enough to see you sacrifice, see you put your life on the line. That's what has encouraged me. That's what's given it to me. He says, I can't drink it. Far be it from me, my Lord, my God, that I should drink this. It's as though I drink the blood of these men who have put their lives in jeopardy to bring me this drink. For at the risk of their lives, they brought it. Therefore, he said, I cannot drink it. These things, these and many of the others around this area, were done by the mighty men. These three mighty men were a big part of it. First thing I want us to remember in the thick of the battle, we need to remember who our enemy is, right? 
The enemy was not within the camp. The enemy was outside the camp. The enemy was the Philistines. The enemy was the one they had to break through and get through to get the water to come out. They were fighting against this garrison of Philistines. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we need to put on the armor of the Lord. Be strong in his power. Be strong in his might. Put on this armor. Why? So that we can stand against the wiles of of the devil. That's our number one enemy, right? Our number one enemy is not within these walls. He's outside. He has no place here. We should not give him any place inside this place of honor and worship of Almighty God. Kick him out. Say, God, when I come through these doors, kick Satan out. Don't let him be in my speech. Don't let him be in my mind. Don't let him be in my heart. Let you reign in this place here today. Our enemy, Satan, is trying to get at us. And we need to remember who he is. And at times, call him out. Call him out in prayer. Say, God, take him away. Beat him. Defeat him today. If it's not Satan, it's one of his, his you know, bunch, one of his demons that are after me. Sometimes it's not Satan, but it's our own flesh. Now, the Bible says it's not against flesh and blood. What's that saying? It's not against people in the scripture that I read of, of Ephesians. But the main object is something we fight against that we can't see. And many times our own flesh, our own desires is something that we can't see. And we fight against that. We fight against our frustrations. We fight against the things that we think we want and we need. We fight against our own desires versus what is good for us, what the Lord wants for us. And what about the spirit of the Antichrist? If you read that in different places of the Bible, we see that as well. We fight against that spirit. The spirit of anti-Jesus, the Antichrist, that is coming upon and will continue to come stronger and stronger in this world. That spirit that is against Christianity. And sometimes we see it in atheism. Sometimes we see it in other religions. Sometimes we just see it in the heart of man, the evil heart of man. And it comes against us, and we need to fight against that. We need to fight against the hate, selfishness, and other things that are sometimes in our own hearts and our own lives. You know, when I look at Ephesians chapter 4, it reminds us, Paul said, I'm like a prisoner. And as a prisoner, I want to remind you to walk worthy of the calling. Walk worthy of that name, believer, Christian, Jesus follower, right? But do it in humility. Do it in lowliness. Do it in gentleness. Do it in patience. Long-suffering is one word that they use. So when you follow the Lord, do it with these ways and bear with one another. He's telling it to the body of believers. Take time. Bear with one another in that spirit of love, the spirit of bond, of peace. And he says right in the middle of that, he says, endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit. Last Sunday, when our men were distraught because one of them, our deacons, one of their own, was sitting in the hospital, literally waiting to be unplugged. Our men, instead of going on with some meeting, instead of doing other things that, yes, were important and are going to be taken care of. But at that moment, they felt like the best thing that they could do is come together as men and pray for one another. Pray for the family. Pray for this church. And what a glorious time of prayer it was, let me tell you. What a wonderful way of coming together in the bond of love and keeping the unity of the spirit, the bond of peace, and saying, this is how we're going to fight right now. We're going to fight with God on our side, praying together. And we came together, lifting up one another and lifting up this church in prayer. Next thing we need to remember when we go into battle is we're not alone. A lot of times we feel like we are. We're going to charge hell with a, fire, with a water pistol, right? I'm going to take care of it. Me, I'm going to do it. And we forget that there's other people around us. There's others that are there that the Lord himself can be with us in battle. The battle is the Lord's. We forget that. Bring him on. You know, unity and coming together in the spirit is the best. And when you remember what David said, I, I, I almost you know, picture him as he runs into battle to fight against Goliath. I don't come against you with the sword or with a shield or with all this other stuff. I come against you with God Almighty. He knew that God was on his side. And he was entering that battle because he wasn't alone. God was with him. This battle is the Lord's. I can imagine that when other people in the Bible felt the same way. When they were entering into a physical, spiritual, and other battle. God was there with them. One of the stories 
and I love in the Bible is of Elisha. It's in 2 Kings chapter 6. It's a very cool story. Write it down, look it up sometime uh, this week. 2 Kings chapter 6. And in this battle, they are after Elisha. The guy after Elijah, Elisha. They're trying to catch him. King said, go find where he is and go capture him. And so he sends an army after one man. One man with, with an assistant, basically. So two guys, he sends this army out. He sends horses and chariots and mass. It says a massive army. And they went even by night to surprise him. We're going to sneak up on Elisha and we're going to catch him and we're going to take him back to the king and the king's going to do you know what to him, right? That was their plan. So they sneak up on him in the middle of the night with this massive army. And the next morning, the scripture says, the, his servant wakes up and he gets up early and he sees all these armies of people encamped. And he's like, oh no. Hey, Elisha, uh, guess what? We have got a problem here. <laughs> we are surrounded. There's just two of us and there's a lot of them, the scripture says. And that's what he's saying. And he says, my master, what are we going to do? He's distraught, but he forgot that he was not alone in the battle, that the army, that the battle was not his, that God was the one. And so the scripture says that Elisha says, it's okay, man, don't be afraid. What? Don't be afraid. For those who are on our side are more than those that are with him. And I don't know if y'all ever saw this show back in back in the 80s or reruns of it, but there was this show with these two, two brothers. And uh, one brother would look at the other brother when he didn't understand something. He'd say, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> and I can only most imagine that's what this guy was saying to Elisha. What are you talking about? There's tons of them. And Elisha said this, Lord, open his eyes. Reveal to him. And God honored that prayer, and immediately his eyes were opened, and it says he looked and he saw surrounding that army on the mountains, the armies of God, chariots of fire all around Elisha. The battle was the Lord's, and there were many on his side, many for him, not against him. And we have to know that, that we're not alone at times, that we are not alone in this battle. And I'm thankful that this week, as I prepared to be a part of two funerals, that there were many of you that were praying and thinking about me. I'm thankful that last Sunday when I stood before you and, and my heart was wrenching for Julia and, and, and praying for, you know, if there was any possible miracle for, for Eddie, but knowing after church, that's where I was going to go. I was going to go and, and go to the hospital, that you were praying and lifting me up. And what a beautiful thing is to know that you have people lifting you up in prayer. And Eddie passed away late Sunday night. Monday, we had David's funeral. And Tuesday morning, I drive up here to the back of the 244, and I'd gotten this text from a friend, a friend who years ago, I'd sat on his front porch and led him to the Lord. Right there on his front porch, he prayed to receive Christ. And you saw this guy who had done his own thing his whole life immediately start following Jesus. And he was in church. Got to do some duck hunting with him. Brought him up to know the Lord, to, to hear what the word of the Lord says. And this text and then this phone call. And as I call him and he answers, he's crying over the phone to me. And I'm sitting down there at the 244 and I'm crying with him over the phone. He says, my wife is dying right now. And she's only 52. Her cancer came back. We thought we'd beat it. And so Tuesday morning was rough after losing Eddie, having a funeral for David, hearing my, my buddy from a long time, you know, crying out his wife is dying and she died that night. I drove home. I wasn't even home. You know, I, my lunch is scattered. Don never knows when I'm coming home for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and I come home for lunch and I open the door and I'm just sitting there listening to music just hurting for a second and this car pulls up my driveway and I didn't recognize it at first I'm like, who's this? And I kind of you know, do that and I'm like, hmm and I get out of the car and it's one of us, one of you Brother Heath, I just want to pray for you right now 
just out of the blue. I just want to pray for you. Held my hands and prayed for me. And I said, you have no idea right now what that means. And I know that not just you, but there are other people praying for me. And it gave me strength in my spirit to know that, that God was surrounding me with prayer and his spirit. The battle was beyond what I could see. And I realized that it was beyond with flesh and blood. And I was encouraged to continue on. You look at the scriptures. There was a stronghold. There was a garrison. And they were focused on water. But it was beyond that. There were spiritual forces. There were struggles that was going on. There's things that are going on in your life. And many times the battle is beyond what you can see. What you can grasp. We have our little world at times. There's nothing wrong with that. We even have our world here. And I'm thankful for it. Because we can look at the news. We can go down to Little Rock. We can go to another country. We can see things that, that sometimes don't affect us, praise the Lord. But there is a huge spiritual warfare, spiritual battle, battle in the United States that, that, that Tony talked about today. It's battle in Canada and other places where people are struggling to do what we do right now. Praise and worship and call the name of Jesus openly and securely. The battle is beyond what we can see. It's beyond what we can touch sometimes. We have to truly get on our knees and fight in prayer, struggle. It's bigger than single battles. God sees it. He knows. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what's going on in your life and in your life and in your life. And he sees all of this. And it's amazing that he can help and orchestrate and send people right when you need it. But it's hard to have that perspective. You know, Jesus was in the garden and he was going to the cross. Even the disciples didn't grasp his perspective. They had their own little world. They had their own little thing. You know, the Messiah is here. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. I'm going to take a sword and we're going to fight for it. And meantime, Jesus is literally over here by himself saying, you have no, big, no clue how big this picture is. I'm going to die. I'm going to be raised from the grave. I'm going to bring the Holy Spirit. He's going to rule and reign your life. In a, in a just a few short time, you're going to have literally 3,000 souls that are going to be saved. And you're going to have to minister and disciple and, and encourage those that go out from here. He saw the big picture. Sometimes we don't see that big picture that the Lord sees. The Lord is developing. You know, these three men in this story for David, they sacrificed their self for the cause. When you think of Romans 12, it challenges us to give our bodies as a living sacrifice. So when we wake up in the morning, that's what our mission is. And, and, and I know there's days that we're sick. There's days that we're hurting. Uh, there's other days, but for the most part at times, we need to remember that each and every day that we're given is a blessing unto the Lord. And that he's got a purpose and a plan for us. And sometimes that plan means giving up of ourselves, giving up of our time frame, giving ourselves as a living sacrifice. You know, we sacrifice for a lot of other things, don't we? We really do. We put our schedule sometimes for ball games and we put it for other things in life and we go here to help someone there sometimes, or we have a focus of something else over there. But what about what the Lord wants for the cause of Christ? Are we sacrificing enough for that? Are we giving ourselves as a living sacrifice? When I'm reminded of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, it reminds us that we can stand. And every priest stands. Day after day, back in that time, they would stand and they would offer a sacrifice. And it would take away sins, but only for a short time. But Jesus, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. He sacrificed his very life, the purity of a life without sin that could beat death and beat the grave for you and me. He sacrificed his self for the cross. And he asks us in the scripture to do what? Take up our cross when we want to, when we feel like it, when everything's smooth and easy. Take up your cross daily 
and come follow me. That's what he says. That's the challenge for us that we're challenged to do. And we see that in the life of people. And we see that in the life of Paul. Because the Bible says in 2 Timothy 4, there's going to come a day when they will not endure sound doctrine. They won't endure what the scripture says. We're in that day, folks. People pick and choose what they want out of this Bible and throw it aside. I don't like that, so I don't like it. Jesus and the Bible's here to please me and my, my feelings right now. That's the way we see the world today for people who are even Christians or even Bible toters at times. This is the day, not sound doctrine. But Paul said this, I am already being poured out like a drink offering. The time of my death, my departure is right at hand. It's close. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. That needs to be our attitude. We sacrifice ourselves. This is the time to do that, to give our lives for the Lord, to fight the good fight, to carry on, to finish the race. You're at the end. You're at the, the, the finish line is right in front of you. For some of you, you know that's closer than others. You feel it. You feel life catching up with you. You know it's right in front of you. Run hard this last leg. Give it your all. Fight the good fight. And then finally, I want to remind you what happened in the life of David. What did he do? Yes, he lost a son. Yes, he was in mourning. Yes, it was a tough time. But at some point... He realized what he needed to do. He needed to go out and do and be who God called him to be. God had called him to be the king. God had called him to, on a mission. And you may not be King David, but God still has a purpose and plan in your life. And so he got up. He washed himself. He anointed his head. He changed his clothes. And it says, and he went to the house of God for worship. And at some point in our life, we need to understand that to in the battle, no matter what's going on, we need to get up. We need to get going. And we have to remind ourselves there's work to be done. We're here at the last leg. There's stuff that we need to do. And how do we do it? What are we a part of? You know, this passage in 1 Kings chapter, 90, uh, chapter 19, you get a picture of being worn out. And so I, I identify with some of you at times. Some of you know it better than me. Elijah knew it very well. Jezebel was trying to kill him. Elijah had had a, a huge mountaintop experience. He'd gone for days and done all this thing, and he was worn out, and his life was on the line. She said, I'm going to kill him, and he ran. He went a day's journey into the wilderness. He didn't get in a car, right? He's taking off. He's running, and he sits down underneath a tree, and he says, God, I just want to die. I don't want her to kill me, and I'm just, I'm worn out right now. Lord, let me die. He says, I've had enough. That may be you. Take my life. And he lay down. And he went to sleep. But an angel came and touched him. Wake up. Wake up, Elijah. And he looked, and there was a loaf of bread, and there were some things baked over hot stones, and there was a, a jug of water there. And he ate, and he drank. He was full, and he laid down, and he went to sleep again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and tapped him on the shoulder, and he said, get up and eat, because the journey is going to be too much for you. And he got up, and he drank. And then he went on in the strength of that food and the strength of the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. God sustained him. God gave him mission. God let him go and keep going. Get up. There is work to be done. Here in this church, here in this community, here in your lives, there is Christian work that we need to be done. This week in staff meeting, we looked at one of the greatest needs of our church. And right now it's Sunday night. Sunday night that for years was a protected night in the life of the church. And I don't just say this church, but many churches. And there are churches in Fayetteville. There's churches in, in Conway area. There's churches in Clarksville. There's Baptist churches all over our state and probably all over the United States. That, that, that day is no longer protected like it used to be. Sunday night. Where have you been 
lately on Sunday night? Where would you like to be on Sunday night? And that could be here worshiping. That could be in a home group worshiping. That could be here serving. Sunday night's the biggest place. Why? Because we have youth. Youth are working. We have some home groups that want to do some things. But we need a place for kids to come too. And maybe for some of you adults. And it may be meaning transferring time, sharing time. Eddie and Julia for years have worked on Sunday nights with Awana. Now, we moved Awana to Wednesday nights. I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with our Awana workers, and it's going well, and the meal on Wednesday nights is awesome. But Eddie's gone, and someone else needs to step up. Some of us need to step up and take that place and serve. I want to encourage you. This battle's tough at times. The battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. And each and everything we do is for Him. Take some water this week to someone in your family, in your church family, in this community that needs an encouragement and give it to them and encourage and pray with them just like these three men did with David. And when they see that, They can go and run like Elijah did for 40 days and 40 nights ministering before the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, strengthen us in this battle that we have today. Battle against the world. Battle against so many other things. Battle against our own flesh and our own struggles. Give us strength today. Speak to us. May we commit our hearts, our lives unto you. Lord, we've sang about it. Let us go from here and live it. May our oasis in this place today of worshiping and honoring you, may it give us a charge. May you, like you fed Elijah, feed us in these moments so we can go out and run a week or two weeks in the power and the strength and the might of you and minister and be ministered to. We pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? God is speaking to you today. If you don't know him, you can't be charged by him. You can't have the strength of the Holy Spirit if you don't know him in your heart and life. If you do, but you haven't had that relationship like you want, you can have that too. Whatever God's asking you to do in these moments, as we sing, you pray, you contemplate. And if you need to come, you come.
I just sent those three guys on a mission. If you want to be a part of that mission, you can. Now, there's somebody in here that can't do it physically, okay? I know you'd want to, Celeste. You'd want to, but don't even try it, okay? <laughs> They're going down the 244. Uh, we left the, the chairs and tables up. We, we were worn out on uh, Friday, uh, but we're having our floors waxed tomorrow and the next day. So if you want to go down there and meet with them, they'll have those doors unlocked. Uh, if you can't do that today, but you can do something else, that's what I put in the bulletin. Go and take water. <laughs> it's water, all right? It may be a physical bottle of water. It may be some type of encouragement. Take it to somebody. And for Pete's sake, you're a Christian. Most of you are. Pray with them, right? Encourage them to continue the fight. God bless you. We love you. Have a good Sunday. Have a good week. Go with the Lord.